Welcome to the Canadian edition of the Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. Andrew, I just, I can't thank you enough for taking the vision that God showed you and being so faithful with it. You honor God's word, you honor his spirit. Thank you for listening to God because so many lives have been changed. And now here's Andrew. Welcome to our Friday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today I'm ending my fourth week of teaching verse by verse through the book of Hebrews, and we are now at the very end of Hebrews chapter 7. Before I get right back into that teaching, let me just remind you that I've got this book. This is a brand new hardcover, 200 plus page book where I've taken my footnotes from my living commentary and put them in printed form. And this book is a uh, verse by verse commentary on every single book verse in the book of Hebrews. And this is the first time we've ever offered this. This is really powerful. I encourage you to please go to the effort of getting that. We're asking for a gift of some amount for that. And then we also have CDs, DVDs, and this is a USB that will have the audio and video on there from this exact teaching. And I've said this many, many times through this series, but the book of Hebrews is absolutely essential if you are going to ever grow unto Christian maturity. It's one of the clearest exposés in the Bible about transitioning from the Old Testament law to the New Testament grace. And I would dare to say that over 90% of the Christians today do not understand the difference between law and grace. And they basically try and mix the two, and you can't do it. The Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 11, verse 6, that you're either saved by grace without works, otherwise grace isn't grace, or you're saved by works without grace, otherwise works is no more works. That's just an old English way of saying you're saved by one or the other, but not by a combination of the two. And most Christians today try and combine the Old Testament law and harshness and punishment and rejection. They try and combine that with the New Testament acceptance and love and mercy and no condemnation, and they just don't fit. This is exactly what Jesus was referring to when he says you can't take a new cloth, a new patch, and put it on an old garment because it'll shrink and tear and it'll destroy the garment. Or you can't put new wine into an old wine skin. He was talking about you can't put the New Testament revelation of grace by Jesus into the Old Testament revelation of law. Law and grace contradict each other. They aren't compatible. The Old Testament law prophesied that grace was coming, and so it's not that it was ever wrong. The Old Testament was appropriate at the time, and it reveals tremendous things to us about God and so I definitely embrace the Old Testament law and study it, and I gain from it, but I don't live under it anymore. I've got a New Testament relationship, and that's what Hebrews is all about. And very, very, very few Christians have been able to uh, understand what Hebrews is saying because the law is so dominant in their thinking they just can't seem to grasp it. So I say all of those things to say that what we're teaching here is absolutely essential. You need this, and it takes a little bit of effort, but it's well worth the effort. So we've been talking about the book of Hebrews and specifically that Jesus is our high priest, and he is a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. That started to be said in Hebrews chapter 5. It's really amplified in Hebrews chapter 7, and we got down to Hebrews 7:27. And it says here that Jesus does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. This word once in this verse is going to be one of the main points of Hebrews chapter 9. So you need to remember this. Hebrews 7.27 says Jesus offered himself once. Basically, the average Christian today believes that Jesus has to offer himself every single time we sin 
that we lose our right standing with God and we have to go back and get Jesus to reapply His blood to us. You'll hear people use this terminology. You need to confess that sin and get it under the blood. And they're talking to Christians. But Hebrews chapter 9 and chapter 10 will show you that through one sacrifice, Jesus perfected you forever. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 10 and 14 say that, and I'll get into more detail. But this is hinted at right here when it says that He did this once when He offered up Himself. And verse 28 says, For the law maketh man high priest which have infirmity, but the word of the oath which was since the law makes the Son who is consecrated forevermore. Man, that is awesome. So now in chapter 8, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1, he goes back and begins to start trying to summarize what he had said up to that point. In other words, he said all of these things to lay a foundation, and now he's going to build upon this. So the first few verses of Hebrews chapter 8 are a summary of what he had already said. In Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1, it says, Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. And again, the terminology or some people just, what is, what is this talking about? It's saying that the tabernacle that Moses built and then later the temple that Solomon built that was uh, patterned after the tabernacle, these are things that men built with physical materials, but they were only a picture of the true temple of God that was in heaven. And you can see that later on as it goes on through here. In verse 3 it says, For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, wherefore it is a necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law. At the time this was written, the uh, temple of Herod was still standing in Jerusalem, and there were Levitical priests that were still offering an animal sacrifices and all of the meat sacrifices and the drink sacrifices and offerings and things like this. So this is just saying that Jesus is a high priest in heaven, in the true temple. He's actually appearing in the very presence of God and offering sacrifices for us because if He was here on the earth, at the time this was written, they still had people that were offering sacrifices in Herod's temple. And so this isn't talking about that. This is talking about in the very heavens, there is a temple in heaven and Jesus entered right into the very presence of God, into the temple of God in heaven. In verse 5, it says, "...who serve..." This is talking about these priests here on the earth. "...serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see..." And now it begins to quote, "...see, saith he, that thou makest all things according to the pattern shown to thee in the mount." So all of this is going back and saying that Moses didn't just come up with this tabernacle on his own and he didn't design something of his own making. But when he was on this mount, uh, Mount Sinai, he was 40 days and 40 nights in the presence of God, came down, broke the tablets, went right back up. So he spent a total of 80 days in the presence of God without food or water. And he literally saw into heaven and he saw the temple that was in heaven. And the Lord gave him a charge and said, see that you make this tabernacle here on the earth according to the pattern that was shown you on the mount. And so there is a true temple in heaven, and the tabernacle was a representation of it. In verse 6 it says, But now he hath obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. Boy, again, this is so radical, and people just read over these things and don't think about it. But this was written to the Jews. That's the reason it's called Hebrews. It was written to the Jews who were just married to the Old Testament law and the sacrifices and the rituals and all of the feast days and all of the different things that were done. And here comes this writer saying that now, through Jesus, we have a better covenant established upon better promises. 
and uh, it's a better covenant. This was so offensive to the Jews. Man, they loved the Old Testament law, even though it was hard on them and it was beating them down. And there are scriptures in the New Testament like 1 Corinthians 15, 56 that sin was strengthened by the law. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7 says the law was a ministration of death. Verse 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9 says the law was a ministration of condemnation. Uh, it says in Romans chapter 7 that the law made sin come alive and it deceived me and it slew me. And I could just go on and on talking about the effects of the law. These were negative things that the law did. Now, they were, they were appropriate at the time because people had been defeated by sin and they didn't realize how deadly sin was. They were looking around and thinking, well, everybody's living this way and they just lost their knowledge of what right and wrong was and they, they just didn't understand how deadly sin was. So when God gave the law, it brought their conscience back to a proper standard, showed them their need for God, and that was the purpose of the law, not to set them free, but to show them how ungodly they were so they would quit trusting in themselves and they would call out to God for help. And if you use the law for that purpose, to show people their need and to show them what a great sinner they are and to condemn them and to kill them, if you use the law for that purpose, it still has a purpose today. There are people today thinking that they can just change their gender, that they can have sex with somebody of the same sex, that they can go out and commit adultery, that they can lie and steal, and that God doesn't care. And for people like that, the law still has a purpose. That's over in 1 Timothy chapter 1. The law is good if a man use it lawfully, knowing that it's not made for a righteous man, but for the ungodly. And if you use the law to show people their sin and to get them to come to the end of themselves, then the law is good. But once you come to Jesus, the law doesn't tell you anything good. It doesn't tell you what Jesus has done for you. All it does is show you your sin and your need to be judged. And the purpose of that is to drive you to God. But once you come to God, you don't need that condemnation. You don't need all of this. You get changed on the inside. And so, because of that, the New Testament grace and the way we relate to God through mercy and grace, not through performance and condemnation and driving people to God through fear, the New Testament is a better covenant established upon better promises. And boy, again, this just infuriated the religious Jews of the day when the book of Hebrews was written and it infuriates the religious people today. I can guarantee you there are people watching this program who have been taught nothing but law. They think that you've got to do everything right and that God rewards you for good performance and punishes you for bad performance. And people who believe that are just incensed by the things that I'm saying. And yet I'm quoting to you scripture. Hebrews chapter 8 verse 6 that Jesus has obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is a mediator of a better covenant. Better than what? Better than the Old Testament law, and it was established upon better promises. And then it goes into the Old Testament and quotes Old Testament scriptures to verify that this isn't contrary to the Old Testament law. It complements the Old Testament law. The Old Testament law prophesied the end of itself. It promised that there was coming a better covenant, and he begins to show that. In verse 7, he says, For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he saith, and this is a quotation from Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. So he's prophesying, he's quoting the Old Testament prophet Jeremiah who prophesied that there was coming a better covenant established upon better promises. So here's the quote. It says in verse 8, For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. Now, the quotation continues on, and I'm going to read the rest of it, but let me just insert that he says the reason that that old covenant 
was not good wasn't because there was anything wrong with the covenant. It was a perfect, perfect standard of holiness. Everything in the Old Testament was correct. The problem with the covenant wasn't the covenant. It was the people who were under the covenant. They were imperfect. And you can't have imperfect people living up to a perfect covenant. So it says he found fault with the people. And that's the reason he had to make a new covenant that wasn't based on our performance, but rather a covenant that was based upon the performance of Jesus, this new priest after the order of Melchizedek. And so the new covenant is not based on our performance. It's based on what Jesus did. And all we have to do to access that is just enter by faith. Romans chapter 5 verse 2 says, We have access by faith into this grace. The only thing that the new covenant demands is accessing God's grace by faith. The old covenant demanded your performance. And the problem with that old covenant was none of us performed perfectly. And so instead of getting the blessing, we got the curse. So again, let me just go back and read this verse, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 9. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. This is still a quotation from Jeremiah chapter 31. So this is the Old Testament prophet Jeremiah prophesying about this new covenant. And it says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. So here's another way of saying this. The Old Testament law told you do this and do this and do this in order to be holy, and nobody could ever live up to that standard. But in the New Testament, it's not outside forces trying to restrain us and making us live holy. But in the New Covenant, God Himself comes and lives and writes these truths on our heart. And we now live holy, not in order to please God, but as a result of already being pleased to God through Jesus. And He changes our heart. He changes our desires so that we want to live for God. Now, not everybody does it well because the Old Testament law will actually make sin come alive and have dominion over you. But if you truly understood grace and operated under grace, you would wind up serving God and being holier accidentally than you ever have on purpose before. Boy, those are radical, radical statements. Verse 11, and it continues to say, And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. What this is talking about is, instead of having somebody from the outside tell you what God is like and tell you this is who God is and this is how He acts, the people under this new covenant would be born again. They would be born from above and they would have an intuitive knowledge of God. God Himself would come live on the inside of them and everybody from the greatest to the least of all Christians would know God in their heart. They wouldn't have to have somebody on the outside tell them how to act. Their own heart would tell them how to act. Again, there's plenty of people who claim the name of Christianity who act just as bad as a sinner. But Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. And there's a lot of Christians that don't know the truth of who they are and what they have. And if they don't know the truth, then by ignorance they can go out and still live in sin. But it's either one of two things. Either they were never truly born again, or if they are born again, they don't know the truth. And that's the reason that sin is still having dominion over them. But a person who gets born again under this new covenant now knows the Lord in their heart. And even some of you who may still be struggling with sin, and you may still be having some of the things dominate you that dominated you before you were born again. If you were truly born again, there's a difference now. Your actions may not have changed that much, but when you go out and sin, now you feel terrible about it. Whereas before, you could go out and sin and not have much conviction about it. 
If you're truly born again, that doesn't mean that you're automatically going to be set free, but it does mean that your heart has been changed. And if you are truly born again, you do not want to live in sin. You may be living in sin. You may be doing a poor job of being a reflection of Christ, but it's because you don't know the truth. The scripture says over in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knows us not, because it knew him not. Verse 2 says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And then verse 3 says, And every man that has this hope in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. So if you've experienced what 1 John 3, 1 and 2 talks about being the sons of God and having this power on the inside of you, if that's truly happened to you, it says you purify yourself, even as he is pure. Now, you may not be doing a good job, but that's your desire to do it. A person who claims to be a Christian and yet can embrace homosexuality, transgenderism, adultery, lying, stealing, and you just go out and live in sin and have no conviction about it, you weren't ever born again. Your heart was never changed. These verses are talking about every person who truly gets born again has a change in their heart, and from the least Christian to the greatest Christian, they have a personal relationship with God and they know God personally. And then the next verse. Man, this this is one of the most amazing scriptures in the Bible. This is a part of this new covenant. Verse 12, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. That is against 99.9% of all Christian teaching today. Man, Christians will say, if you aren't living holy, if you go out and live in sin, God's angry at you. God's upset. God's going to leave you. I actually was in a church service one time where a guy got up and said, God is angry. God's upset. Besides all of that, I am not here, (laughs) which was stupid. If he wasn't here, why would he sit there and be speaking through this person? But this is what a lot of people do. They think that when they mess up that God is angry with them. This new covenant is specifically saying that he will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and iniquities. Well, I remember no more. So many Christians are living under a a shadow of their past sins and feeling like they're a second-class Christian, thinking that God still holds these things against them. Maybe they're forgiven, but they'll never be embraced the way that somebody else who hasn't done those things That is not part of the new covenant. That's at the very least your own conscience condemning you and probably at the worst, Satan magnifying your conscience and just beating you down. But that's not part of the new covenant. I'm out of time today, but I'm going to continue this on our programs. I'm going to start here with uh, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 12. And as we get into chapter 9, these are some of the most radical things in the Bible. Again, let me encourage you to please get this brand new book that we're offering. It's a 200 plus page hardback book where it goes verse by verse through the uh, every verse in Hebrews. And this is powerful. We're offering this for a donation. And then we have CDs and DVDs and a USB that will take the audio and the video from these programs. And we're making all of this material available. Please listen to our announcer and then please call or write today. Hello, this is Andrew Womack and I just want to advise you that next week I've got David and Tim Barton coming on and we're going to preempt my television programs to interview them. These are some of the greatest uh, experts in American history and we are going to be applying a lot of things in this nation to this upcoming election. And I tell you, it's going to be really, really powerful. So you need to check it out next week's program with David and Tim Barton. Andrew is pleased to announce the release of his brand new book, Hebrews, Living in the New Covenant Reality. This hardback book includes all of Andrew's personal study notes and commentary on the book of Hebrews as compiled from Andrew's Living Commentary software. Discover the transformative truths of the book of Hebrews when you get Andrew's brand new book, Hebrews, Living in the New Covenant Reality, today. Andrew's complete series, Hebrews, Living in the New Covenant Reality, is available as a book, 
CD album, TV, DVD album, and USB made from our daily television broadcast. Each of these valuable resources are available when you contact us. Go to our website at awmc.ca to see all the ways you can get these products. Or you can call the Andrew Womack Ministries Canada Helpline Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Time at 647-348-2220 to order. Do you want to dive deeper into God's Word? Now you can with Andrew Womack's Living Commentary. I'd like to encourage you to get this living commentary. We call it a living commentary because I'm still writing it. And I've written footnotes on over 27,000 verses in the Bible. And I promise you, this is powerful. It's not only got my commentary and experiences and revelations that God has given me, but it's got Greek and Hebrew words defined. It's got references and just all kinds of things here. It would be a tremendous blessing to you. So check it out, our living commentary. The Living Commentary includes two dictionaries, four commentaries, and 12 versions of the Bible, plus atlases and biblical maps. Grow in the Word with Andrew's Living Commentary software. You can enjoy the Word of God wherever you are, on your phone, computer, or tablet. Download the Living Commentary today. Am I a mistake? Why do I still deal with depression? Why does life feel meaningless? Have I wasted my I life? Is it sick? too late for me? God's people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. If you've got any problem in your life, it's really because you don't understand fully what God has done. This word is the greatest gift that God has ever given us because this is how we know Him. I'm promising you preparation time is never wasted time. Regardless of what you feel that God has called you to do, you need to be prepared. I'd like to let all of you, our Canadian viewers, know that we have a Bible college in Toronto, and we would love to have you come and be a part of it. There's multiple ways you can take advantage, not only through the campus there in Toronto, but we have online courses, we have correspondence courses, uh, just a number of ways, but we want to help you, and we're making it as available to you as we possibly can. So check it out with the information's on your screen, our Carius Bible College, Toronto. If Andrew's teachings are making a difference in your life, consider becoming a Grace Partner with Andrew Womack Ministries Canada today. Grace Partners are special friends of the ministry who commit to giving $30 or more per month to help Andrew reach thousands of people here in Canada and around the world with the life-changing message of God's unconditional love and grace. If you'd like to become a Grace Partner today, go to awmc.ca or call our helpline Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Time at 647-348-2220. Also, to learn more about the vision and mission of Andrew Womack Ministries Canada, be sure to visit our website at awmc.ca. While there, you'll also find details about all of the products available and be able to access many of Andrew's teachings absolutely free. You can listen to them while you're online or download them for later and listen on the go. Remember, that's awmc.ca. Thank you for your support, and we look forward to hearing from you today.